Hello and welcome to Become the Teapot. I'm Ian. And so am I. And this is a podcast in which we watch a film, read the comics that it's based on, and then have a bit of a natter. As we continue our mission to discuss comic book adaptations, we're staying in the DC universe. Well, kind of. To discuss Francis Lawrence's 2005 film, Constantine. Which is loosely based on the Dangerous Habits storyline from the pages of Hellblazer by Garth Ennis and Will Simpson. Well, we better get started before Satan comes up here to collect our souls. Right, well, Constantine, it's a 2005 film, as you said in the intro, directed by Francis Lawrence and starring Keanu Reeves as American exorcist John Constantine, (laughs) who was born with the ability to see half-breeds, a term that makes me feel extremely uncomfortable every time they say it in the film. (laughs) Anyway, at the beginning of the film, John gets cancer and then engages in an almost completely unrelated plot involving the Antichrist. So, have you seen this film before? Did you like it? I have seen this film before, and I actually forgot most of the film when I rewatched it. This is right up my current street, you know, watching Supernatural and all. Mm -hmm. Minor series 12 spoilers. Not really spoilers, it's more of a plot point. I'm not going to watch it. But, well, more for the listeners. Oh, okay. But it does contain um, Satan, and there's a, um, a story arc about the birth of Satan's son. So it really does fit very nicely into this world that they've got in this film. (laughs) I mean, yeah, it's a it's a tried and tested formula with the omen and the antichrist and things like that. So yeah, Mm. but yeah. Anyway, back to Constantine or Constantine, whatever you say, whatever I say. I think I'll bounce between the two. (laughs) Well, the film the film definitely pronounces it Constantine. Yeah, but the name of the character in the comic books is Constantine. Yeah, actually, I did see a panel where. He's talking, I don't know which one it's from. He's talking to a gardener or someone. They're in a garden, I don't know. But they say, <laughs> oh, thanks, uh, John Constantine. And, and he goes, Tyne. It's Constantine. Yeah. Funny. Uh, but anyway, yeah. back to the film. This has to be a naughty's film because it has the Shire sidekick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in yeah. this, he, he plays the peppy Chaz Kramer. You know, around this time, you had iRobot, same character. Yeah. You had Indiana Jones 4. Same character. <laughs> <laughs> I've got this exact same comment in my notes as well. I've got, uh, even Sheila LaBeef uh, in his full early 2000s sidekick mode isn't too annoying here, is what I put down. Yeah, it's not too bad, it's is it? It's not bad. Plus he dies, uh, spoilers. So, you know, that's a bonus. Oh, no. Oh, but did you watch the post-credits? <laughs> I did watch the post-credits, yeah. yeah. I, I've gotten to a really bad hammock. Habit? No, nope, I've gotten into a really bad habit, uh, <laughs> thanks MCU, to always skip past credits, when, especially if I'm at home. Mm. And it's every film that I'm watching now. It's not just an MCU film or a comic book film. And um, the last two, three films that I've watched, there's not been one. So I thought, ah, oh, I don't have to do it on all films. Yeah. So anyway, up come the credits, we turn it off, I go up to bed uh, on YouTube and stuff, as I am. Oh, what's this I find? A Constantine credit, post-credits. I was like, damn it! The one time that I didn't do it and there's one there. Yeah, it's, it's I not did worth it. exactly the same. <laughs> it's not worth it. It's a really bad scene. But he comes back as an angel. Or he was always an angel. I'm confused what the implication there was. He flies off to go meet Indy and <laughs> joins the cast of yeah. Indiana Jones 4. And fight some robots. <laughs> yeah, well. You missed the opportunity there to call it a dangerous habit as well. You called it a bad habit. But yeah, so, I mean, overall, I don't think it's that bad. I think I, I've got a really the opposite of fond, <laughs> anti-fond <laughs> um, memory of this film. And I don't know why. Anti-fond. If, yeah, you know, the, 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 the opposite of a fond one. And I think I, I was going into it thinking, oh, here we go, another early film from the noughties. Oh, it'll be a bit poop. But I think overall, I actually quite enjoyed it. I mean, when you compare it to the comic, I mean, take it at face value, is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I think we may have mentioned it in the show before. I think it may have even been when John was on. but um... John Coxtantine. <laughs> <laughs> And I was quite um, negative about it at the time, and, mm. and like you say, my overriding memory of it that it was was that it was a piece of crap. You yeah, know, I thought it was from the same era that brought us, you know, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and Van Helsing oh, no. and Max Payne and things like that. <laughs> and I thought it was going to be the same as those, but it's it's honestly not that bad. Yeah, it's not great. Yeah, but I perhaps not pleasantly surprised. Yeah, no, let's go with that. I I didn't I didn't mind it. It was quite good. You didn't hate it. No, not at all. No. Not at all. Good. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, as I was saying, the character, they've changed a fair bit from the comics. Mm. Um, you know, he's got black hair, black tie, black trench coat. Like, just make it all dark, you know, rather than his classic red tie and his blonde yeah. hair and whatever. But I did see a clip of Keanu in, is it From Hell or something Hell, where he puts on an English voice and it's a terrible English accent. Oh, well, that's in Dracula. Dracula, there you go, yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm glad they, they didn't force him to do an English accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is it. You know, I, I think my initial thoughts on this film were probably clouded by the casting of John Constantine. Mm. You know, Keanu is famously not a particularly expressive actor. Yep. I don't really think he captures the self-loathing of Constantine, Constantine, that we get in the comic books. Mm. But he's fine here. You know, he is playing this version of a character. It yes. may not actually have much bearing on the comic book character, but it's a sort of West Coast surfer version of, <laughs> of John Constantine. It's like, okay, well, you know, that's a different take, but it works fine for this. You know, his yeah. sort of, it stays within his parameters as an actor. Yeah, I can I can just see him walking off the set of Point Break and just having a haircut and going, right, let's go kill some demons. <laughs> that was a long walk. That was quite a long time <laughs> I mean, he, he, he doesn't resemble the character, like you said. Mm -hmm. Black hair, American. It's not even the same demeanour, really. Yeah. His origin is different he's got this whole thing about dying for a moment and then yeah, now you can see uh, half yeah, breeds yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's kind of an odd story but i mean the thing i was thinking i was because i was quite down on those changes and then i start thinking well i haven't got a problem for instance with you know what they're doing with namor for black panther i think it looks yeah. really interesting and that is as far removed from a comic book character on paper anyway from the appearance of the trailers they've really changed his origins and his aesthetic but you know i'm fully on board with something like that so i don't know if it's uh because this character is british as are we mm -hmm. or if it's because the comic book character does feel very british yeah that's so that's something that I will touch on in the comic bit. But yeah, in this, Constantine, Tyne, whatever, he's blunt, he's straight to the point. Mm. Uh, you can tell that he's been through a lot and seen some shit, but then also like from his bluntness comes the humour. Yeah. And he has got pretty cool gear as well. You know, he's got the, um, the cross engraved... Uh, what do you call them? Knuckle dusters. That's the one, thank you. And that pretty sweet cross shotgun towards the end. Yeah. So I think they're they're trying to make him a little bit more cool, a little bit more like, oh look at look at all these toys he's got. But yeah. it's not overplayed. So it, I think it does work for the world that they've built and I do like the sort of in film lore that they've worked upon and you can kind of feel like this is a real world. Yeah. It's not just a guy walking around going, I'm Constantine, I'm gonna kill demons. <laughs> That'd be a pretty boring film. <laughs> it would be quite a boring but they've they've definitely lent into the uh, equipment side of things as opposed to in the comic books where he dabbles in magic quite a lot and he just yes. sort of goes around and he can whip up a spell here and there mm -hmm. uh, whereas i think in the film he really only does that one spell with the rag doesn't it when he sets it on fire i think that's about it i don't think yeah um i mean i don't know if you class it a spell when he sort of crosses over to hell when he puts his feet in water yeah, maybe same yeah, with uh, rachel vice's character weiss's character i always get her name wrong <laughs> and then also towards the end when he puts his arms together and he certainly chants something mm. so there's like little chants here and there little bits sprinkled through yeah but yeah i don't think if someone watched this film you'd go oh okay so the main power of this guy is he's magic it'd be like the main power of this guy is he looks cool. <laughs> he's got tattoos. He looks cool, and he's he's got a lot of gold equipment. <laughs> gold that that notoriously strong metal that's really good for making things out of. <laughs> Actually, just um, just talking about John here. Mm. You know when he goes into the chair at Papa Midnight's club, whatever or basement or whatever. Oh it is, yeah, yeah. Would you say that's an exposition dump? I read. I wasn't too sure because effectively it shows us stuff we've already seen, mm. but then it sort of builds upon it a bit. Yeah, I don't think so. I think it's advancing the plot enough that it isn't really an exposition dump, but it is certainly, there is exposition there. It didn't yeah. feel particularly egregious, though. It wasn't like uh, Man of Steel <laughs> yeah. last year, last week. Last year, well. Last year, last <laughs> last week, uh, with uh, old jor -El's PowerPoint. So yeah. no, it wasn't quite that bad, in nah, a okay. stretch. Fair enough. What was, actually, I didn't like the voiceover. Yeah, okay. Especially at the end, where he's like, some people like me and some people don't, or whatever the hell he said. It's like, well, okay. And then he put some chewing gum in his mouth because he's quit smoking. Yeah. That's like a of, good boy. Bit of crap, wasn't it? I liked that they committed to the smoking, though, throughout the film. He really, yeah. you know, constantly was had a cigarette in his mouth. I thought, yes, that is true to the character, because that's the kind of thing that I imagine Hollywood would uh, have problems with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, try and cut out. Yeah, 
But I, I suppose it's a story about a character with lung cancer, so there's already an anti-smoking message right there, isn't there? So, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'm just going back to sort of the, the wider world then mm-hmm. that I was talking about. Yeah. I do like Papa Midnight's Club. Uh, it's like a neutral ground, yep. very much like the hotel in John Wick, yes, where yeah. demons, angels, who half-breeds, whatever, can just walk in, get a drink, party, and then leave. Mm. And I like, like the little, there's a bouncer with those cards. That's quite, you know, clever. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, with this this is probably third, fourth of the actor who plays him. Third or fourth comic book role. I learned how to say his name for a video that I did ages ago, and now I've forgotten how to say his name. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to pronounce. <laughs> but yeah, I was pleasantly surprised to see him in there. Hmm. You can almost see like a history between him and John, but then I kind of feel like that would have made a good film, like showing them what had happened. Well... Papa Midnight, I think, is in the comic books. Uh, he is, yes. So, yeah, he is a character from the comic books. So, yeah, I mean, if you want more of that character and their interactions, there are options available to you. And I think he was, you know, like you said, I liked the sprinkling of colourful characters that they, they popped in here. You had that, you had the funny British guy who collected items for him. You had, <laughs> yeah. You had, obviously, Sheila Beef. Yeah, actually, really good cast. You know, Rachel Weiss, Tilda Swinton, Peter Stormare at the end, having an absolute mm. blast as Lucifer. Love it. I love it so much. <laughs> he was so good. Loved him. Um, so yeah, now it's a really, for an early 2000s supernatural noir action film, mm. really stacked cast. Well, did you know, just while we're talking about casting, did you know that your boy, Nick Cage, was attached to the role for a long time? Well, okay, for a time. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. He was going to be John Constantine. <laughs> and then I can't remember who the act, um, who the director was, but he said that with Nick attached to the role, he couldn't make the film that he wanted to. Right. So he pulled out and then Nick pulled out and then they were just like, we need someone. And then Keanu just came off the back of The Matrix. Yeah. And like, right, he'll do. <laughs> He's a big name draw at that point. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But yeah, the cast is amazing. I said I forgot a lot of this film when going back to it. I forgot how it ended. Not seen it in such a long time that when Constantine's dying on the floor, I thought he was praying to the big man upstairs. But then up comes Satan. Yeah. Um, but then just as we were talking before we came on, uh, he actually is talking to God, apparently, according to quotes on IMDb. <laughs> yeah, because he says, I am I know I'm not welcome in your realm or whatever he says. Yeah. So it's, yeah, which is obviously a plot of the film is that he's not, he can't get into heaven. Mm. But yeah, and then I forgot about... Um, if you would be so kind to say that guy's name, the actor who plays Satan. Um, oh, Peter Stormer. Thank you, because I forgot it and also couldn't probably say it. I forgot he was in this film. And yeah, he's having an absolute blast with the role. He is. I can just see that sort of seedy darkness coming from him. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, he's just a great person to throw in. Like He's got like, I don't know, 10 minutes of screen time. Probably not even that. Five. Yeah. Uh, and it's just a really good ending. <laughs> <laughs> it is amazing. He sort of descends down with those like dripping feet. I think you're meant to think he's Jesus at one point because, you know, the, yeah. the crucifix pose. But yeah, white suit. Absolutely. Mate. I mean, it's nothing like the Lucifer Morning Star from the comic books. Mm-hmm. Who you're familiar with. You've watched some of his appearances in Lucifer, haven't you? Or... I've seen clips of Lucifer, mm. but he does appear in a crossover with the Arrowverse. They do a massive, like, yeah. Elseworlds crossover event. Crisis. And they bring in his show. Else. Yeah, yeah Crisis. Like, one of the, they've done several right. crossovers. But, in fact, Constantine, played by Matt Ryan, mm-hmm. goes to knock on his door. And the universe that they've classed his universe as is 666. That's quite a nice little bonus Easter egg for you there. I get it. Yeah, and it shows that Constantine and him have a relationship or a history, should I say. But yeah, it, it's very, very... It's a different take. It's much darker, much eviler, <laughs> if that's a word, <laughs> take on it. I actually watched that clip as part of my research, Ooh. the bit where he meets them. And uh, it's a guy from Miranda, isn't it? Which is odd. Yeah, Lucifer. yeah really weird. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's he's playing extremely camp. I thought that was hilarious as well. So I was... Uh, mm. <laughs> I think that... Whoever is playing Lucifer just apparently he wants to camp it up. I'm watching uh, Sandman at the moment as well, which has got the same. I was going to ask Lucifer. actually, uh, and that's Lucifer Morningstar. That's played by Gwendolyn Christie from Game of Thrones, which you've not watched. So uh, I'm not a Thronehead, no, or a Gamehead, or whatever the fans are called. <laughs> I don't think it's that. Fans of Throne. <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to look um, it up. Yeah, that, that that is that is on my list. Uh, it's something that hopefully I would have watched all of it by our next episode. It's really good. I think if you get to episodes five and six, uh, sort of the high point, certainly, mm. they're really good episodes. 
no, it, it starts off much like the comic does. I won't go into plot spoilers because you've not watched it yet. Mm-hmm. The comic starts off a little bit shaky as well. And I think the TV show, obviously having to follow that sort of plot line, feels quite episodic at the beginning. But then yeah. when it starts to ramp up in, in episodes five and six, I think that's where it gets really good. Oh, cool. yeah. As I said, it, it's on my list. Yeah. We're not here to talk about Sam. No, right? anyway, it, it happened again. We always do it. <laughs> Putting it back to the scene. Um, the scene, the film even. I do like the way that it's shot. Yeah. I mean, it is very dark and it's got that sort of grey overtones, but that's the look that they've chosen. So fair enough. I do like the scene where Balthazar, a different half breed, uh, your favourite saying, mm-hmm. makes Father Hendersy, is it? Binge drink in the shop. Yes. And um, again, I forgot a lot of this film. So when the scene was happening, I was like, oh, that's weird. And then suddenly he kills over and all this liquid starts coming out of his mouth. I'm like, what the hell? So I like the fact that well, the way it's been shot is very clever because as he's pouring it, it's not coming out. Yeah. So in, as it goes out of his hand, you see it coming off the shelf. And you're like, that's re- like little or hints and just the way that it's done yeah and then you find out that he's drunk himself to death and it's quite sad but it's just the way it was shot that i think that's really clever no i think some of the creature design and the design for hell as well the idea of hell being mm-hmm. you know sort of a parallel but all misty, all misty. Um, <laughs> it's just mist, <laughs> just all misty. mist there. <laughs> that's kind of it isn't it it sounds like, awful <laughs> go outside too early that's basically hell <laughs> a bit of morning dew oh horrible no, I think I think some of the designs really good. Some of the creature designs as well. So yeah, I think uh, yeah, there's a lot of strong points to the film. I still don't think it's necessarily, as I say, a great film. Yeah. It's two hours long. It's a little bit mumbly, and it is a little bit generic in its sort of structure. Yeah. But as I say, as far as early 2000s fantasy films you could do a lot worse believe me yeah and we have yeah well yeah well we definitely have but yeah I think it is quite generic but because of the the strong cast it tips the scales in its favor and uh, it might become one of my sort of guilty pleasure films I mean it's not a great film but over time I might go back to it and go actually it's you know it's one of those films you go yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah, I genuinely don't think it needs to be a guilty pleasure either. I think it's it's fine. It's good. You know, solid film. I don't. I can't see it being anyone's favourite film. It might be, but it's also not unmitigated trash like uh, some of the others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, we've sort of said about how it compares or doesn't compare to the comic book character. Mm. So uh, shall we hop on over to the pages of Hellboy? Nope. Oh, hold on. Hellboy. That's not Hellboy. <laughs> no. That would Hellblazer. be very confusing for everyone if we just start talking about Hellboy now. <laughs> <laughs> right, so half man, half demon, he's from hell. Yep. No, right, okay. Yeah, so, so that is pretty close, isn't it? Yeah, let's talk about Hellblazer, shall we? That makes more sense. So Hellblazer Dangerous Habits is the title of the storyline we've been reading. It's by Garth Ennis and Will Simpson. Mm -hmm. It's a six-issue storyline that ran from the issues of Hellblazer 41 to 46. This is the first story arc written by Irish writer Garth Ennis in what would go on to be one of John Constantine's... Constantine's? I'm saying it's... (laughs) Um... What would go on to be one of John Constantine's seminal runs? So, Dangerous Habits tells the story of an occult con man, John Constantine, who, after learning he has lung cancer, goes on a self-destructive bender before conning the devil into saving him, essentially. Yep. I mean, I'll start actually by saying, before reading the comic, I know that you've watched Constantine yep. and uh, Legends of Tomorrow, yep. so you've got some familiarity with the character, but what mm-hmm. was your overall familiarity with this version, with the comic book character? I think the closest version of the comic book character that I've involved myself with, or at least sort of watched even, is uh, the DC do a lot of animated films. Mm. And I watched Justice League Dark. Yep. Uh, and that's also voiced by Matt Ryan. So they just, yeah. uh, they just love this casting. Uh, also in a, in a couple of games and whatever. Yeah, I think that's, once I've read this comic, that is something that you kind of think, that is actually the closest portrayal, I think, that they've got on screen, is these cartoon comic book films. Hmm. So yeah, I, I've not read anything with him in it. Um, I did then, off the back of watching Justice League Dark, I did get a couple of Justice League Dark comics, which, as always, they went on my shelf and stayed there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's on my list of, of to read in the future. I think it's the first couple volumes. Yeah. Uh, so it's not just, just like a s- single issue. I think it's the first couple books. Yeah, so that is... I've read those as well. That's the one that partners up Zatanna and the Demon Etrigan and things like that. Yes. Yeah. 
And I think Swamp Thing makes it makes an appearance. Yes, because obviously John Constantine originated in Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. Mm. So I've got the Swamp Thing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, my familiarity in terms of John from the comics, I have read this comic before. I've read mm-hmm. other runs of, of Ennis's Constantine or Hellblazer. I don't think I've read the whole run, but... Um, I've mostly read about him from other titles. You know, I, I think Swamp Thing, like we said, Neil Gaiman, Sandman, and much later, Justice League Dark, like yourself. So, yeah, I mean, this is probably my first time revisiting the character in his own title for 20 years, you know? This is... Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I I did think that you would have probably read this one, because mm. uh, I know there are some comics we've covered that you've not read before, but this does fit into the wider world of DC and you've gone through your periods across your life of going into the DC stuff. And yeah. I'm assuming you read it when it's coming out. No, hold on. No, you well, no, done. I was, no, you I would have done, done three. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I realised when it first came out, which was a 91. little bit beyond my comprehension at that point, <laughs> I think. I'm assuming that this was, this was your like bedtime story. <laughs> yeah. They tucked me in and they said, let's see what John Constantine's up to this month. He's just called the devil a c- <laughs> whoa whoa i didn't say that on our boys episode i know you didn't. say that on this episode <laughs> beep that out boy <laughs> i'll beep out it's fine silly boy no i didn't read it as it was coming out i revisited it around the same time i read sandman for mm-hmm. the first time i think so probably early 2000s so yeah. i would have been about 13 14 yeah. that sort of age okay. yeah i really liked the character so that's why i went back and read you know other things from him mm-hmm. and i like that he's part of the dc universe but not really ties to it in a strong way you know his own thing yeah it's not a comic in my eyes that you'd pick up and go oh where's batman where's superman are they gonna make an appearance yeah i mean like we said with justice League dark you get bits of those coming through but that's not his own comic yeah well that's it and it's a very different tone to a lot of dc superhero comics you know it's far more character focused it's yep. more concerned with his psyche and his self-loathing it, it's not really about flashy spectacle you know there are no sly winks like you say to or cameos to dc characters you know superman doesn't pop in and say i can cure your cancer <laughs> wow what, what a great power <laughs> <laughs> he's got every other power he might as well <laughs> you know i'm not saying those things are necessarily bad though i mean when they do happen in the comic book from time to time they feel more earned because it's not all the time yeah but yeah no i really liked hellblazer for how character focused and how subdued it is there's no big action spectacles and that mm-hmm. is john constantine really is he isn't a superhero he's just sort of a guy going around trying to get by yeah exactly um i was looking forward to this when you said it was coming up and i thought oh that's cool I've, I've seen tv i've hmm. seen that whatever but then when you said it was by garth ennis i was like oh i don't 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 be <laughs> just just don't <laughs> just, oh like so i went into it with almost like treading on eggshells was like oh let's just see how this goes but yeah i think the first couple of issues for me are a tad slow right um but once i finished it and then i looked back on it i think it, it was the right way to start the story arc yes when reading it i was thinking hey it just feels like he was given some bad news by the doctor and then starts popping around to see his friends people that are close to him and in constantine fashion not saying goodbye and then just going out and getting pissed yeah i'm like well that's two issues that have wasted my time <laughs> yeah, when you look back you think oh actually it's just to show how almost alone he is and yeah. how he's not the same character as we see in the film he's a lot more well he's got a lot more self-hatred that's it yeah and i think as well this was following on from a 40 issue run and um i think there'd been a big death in that storyline sort of the culmination of that storyline was a really tragic event so this sort of picks up six months after mm-hmm. that so it makes sense for that character to be in that place i think that's referenced in this comic book in fact yeah so yeah i know what you mean when we talked about the boys it's got Garth Ennis as well yes. and I said in that episode I think it was that I was hesitant to revisit some of Garth Ennis's earlier work mm-hmm. I said about uh, Preacher for instance because mm-hmm. I thought it might not hold up it might just be edgelord bullshit like <laughs> the boys is but I, I mean I'm, I'm quite happy to say that uh, I didn't find it slow I found it the character work is what that was really focusing on those first couple of issues yeah and uh, I really enjoyed it 
I think the character, you know, this rough around the edges, chain smoking, drinking, swearing, yep. plays into all of Ennis's strengths, but with that early, you know, that sort of early Ennis charm, there is still, uh, you know, there's there's heart to it. Yeah. It's not just that nonsense for nonsense sake. Yeah. I think as well, because I know we said it's not quite in the wider DC world. It is a little bit, but not quite. Mm. I think he's trying to pull back a bit. So he's got in the restraint of the DC world. So we can't mm. just take it and run with it. Where the boys, he created that so he can do whatever he wants. Yes. And he does in Preacher, in fairness. Oh, okay. That's all tackling religion. And there's some really uh, offensive stuff in there. Well, there is a surprising amount of swearing. Yeah. Uh, no hard C's like I've just dropped, but um, <laughs> there's, uh, yeah, there's quite a lot of swearing. Considering this isn't even Vertigo at this point, I don't think. I think it's pre-Vertigo, so it is actually just mm. published in DC Comics. Yeah. I forgot that Garth was Irish or half Irish. Irish, I think, yeah. Irish. I forgot about that when I was reading it. But um, I do like that, much like V for Vendetta, Mm. this is just covered with British mannerisms Mm. and things that the UK would kind of go, oh, that's something in England sort of thing. You know, I think John quotes the magical mystery tour, obviously the Fab Four from Where He's From. Yeah. Um, And then just talks about, you know, him going to see... Big Ben and Parliament and whatever. Yeah. So it does feel like a very English or British comic to me. It does, yeah. You know, it's not all Big Ben and London Bridge or whatever it is. Yeah, it's not there, that, it's not that obvious. <laughs> also places that actually look like your average British suburb and things like that. Mm-hmm. I've seen this in other comics where they have a, they clearly have an American artist. Yeah. And so the writer sends it in and says it's set in this suburb and the American artist clearly draws American suburbs. Yeah. You look at the art and you think, well, that is not, that doesn't look anything like Britain. Mm. You know, you'd think it would just be houses, but there are, you know, there's cultural differences yeah. that like you say, are throughout this comic book do actually feel very representative. In fact, when he goes to Ireland especially, Mm -hmm. you could tell that there was a lot, you know, names of places and things. Like, you know, you could tell there was a lot of Garth Ennis' own focus on that. Oh, yeah, yeah, because there we go. I've I've just made that little (laughs) connection now. They go to Ireland. (laughs) Yes. But yeah, I love how uh, Brendan, is it? One of his friends, Mm -hmm. turns that pool of holy water into Guinness. There's even a joke there about how bad the Guinness is over in England uh, compared to the proper for Irish stuff, which... <laughs> I can vouch is correct. I drink a lot, but I went to Ireland a few years back and the stuff over there tastes so much cleaner and crisper. And it's it's mm. so much nicer than this stuff. Not saying our stuff's bad, yeah. but in comparison, it is. Yeah. Well, they, yeah, they keep the good stuff. They keep the good stuff for themselves. Give us the pish. <laughs> Fair enough. I didn't actually expect as much parallels to the film as there were. Mm. It was the first time picking up a comic from Hellblazer or from Constantine. There you go. Happy. Constantine. <laughs> Damn it, I can't even got it wrong. <laughs> I tried so hard to get it right, I got it wrong. But yeah, obviously there's the cancer arc in this, you know, yeah. pretty self-explanatory. That's the big driving point in it, yeah. Yeah, he goes to Gabriel for help. He kills himself mm-hmm. to bring up Satan. Also kills himself in the same way by cutting his wrists. Yeah. And then how the devil then saves his life as well by sucking out the cancer. There's a lot of big plot points in this that are in the film that are thinking, oh, wow, that's actually, that's made the jump from comic to screen. Yeah. And it, it works well, I think. Yeah, I I think they do a good job. I like that they, uh, spoilers for the end of the comic books if you're listening at home and you want to read along. The ultimate way that he cures his cancer is uh, he cons three devils or three versions of Satan, the three brothers. Mm. Essentially sells his soul to three of them or sells it to two of them and has a blood feud with Lucifer. Yes. So all three of those are going to uh, want his soul and have a claim to his soul. And as such, none of them can claim it without there being all out war in hell, which they can't afford to do. Yeah. I like that resolution. I like that it is a con as opposed to uh, a heroic sacrifice as it is in the film. Yeah. But they still, it's similar sort of resolution. It's played as if instead of it being each of the devils trying to claim his soul, it's God and the devil yeah. trying to claim the soul and the devil cures this cancer so that similar. God can't yeah. have him. Yeah. Which, you know, it's got a similar vibe, but it's it certainly seems more altruistic in the film. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the in the comic, I finished that issue, because that's issue five, and I thought, well, there you go, nice little ending. And then there's like a prologue, uh, issue six. And I think, where can it go from here? Obviously, oh, I do, I do like his little, is it Matt, the cancer patient? Mm-hmm. He's a, a nice little character in, in the comic. Yeah. But yeah, the, the last issue is him walking away from it. it goes on a 2D bender again, because it, it's constant time. Yep, nailed it. Yes. Um... 
And but then he comes away and thinks, how cocky am I? Because obviously he's, he's he's a lot more cockier in the comic than he is the film. Yes. He's walked away from it and thought, I've just put heaven and hell and earth. I've put myself in front of it. You know, I, it's either take my soul or destroy heaven, hell, and earth. And it was quite helpful that they chose to save him. Yeah. Because imagine if they they hadn't, they just blew up everything. Yeah. Well, they they went to war, destroyed everything. Heaven rode in and took over the rest. Yeah. yeah but you see him. The sort of self hatred again, going, "Don't be a dick." Like, what? Mm-hmm. Why have you done that? I mean, it worked out for the best, which is good. But you can definitely see the yeah. aftermath of him going, "You're such a knobhead." <laughs> like, don't do that again. And there's that real thing of everything he's doing; it just makes things worse, mm. getting worse and worse. And you can see that this is just creating a whole extra problem for him. You know, he's okay; his cancer's cured, but he sold his soul to three different devils. Yeah, this is going to have long term ramifications. And you can see, and this is what the character does, like. So the self-loathing nature of him and he just digs himself into trouble mm-hmm. and then has to scrape his way out and he usually gets out by the skin of his teeth it's like have you ever seen there's a couple of films by the Safdie brothers Good Time and Uncut Gems uh, no yeah so that's Adam Sandler Uncut Gems isn't that's it the one. and the other one is Batman um, what's his name R. Pats R. Pats yeah um, Good Time's on my list no, I will be watching that at some point. Both very good films, but both not easy watches because they oh, okay. are just this ramp, <laughs> this ramping tension of just bad decision piled on top of bad decision. Right, and that's what John Constantine is like. Mm. John Constantine is like. Yeah. Is, uh, oh no, I'm doing it now. It's annoying. <laughs> that's what John Constantine is like. I feel like if you're going to make a film version of him or a TV version, that's what he should be in. This it's just awful, awful decisions yeah. over and over again. I mean, in the comic, I mean, I've not sort of said a lot about Constantine. I'm. <laughs> I really have to think now. I'm going to start just saying John. That's just easier. Yeah. With John in the comic, effectively, you do see his decline as obviously the cancer's getting worse and he's going downhill. Mm-hmm. He tries to con people or to get out of it and to ask people for help and all of this sort of stuff. But it gets to a point when he first sees Chaz in the comic that Chaz is just like outright tears him a new one, shouts at him, says about what a horrible friend he is, all of this stuff. And John's at the end of his tether or rope and he's like, yeah. Fair enough. Mm. And it's like, he's so far tired and so far gone that he's like, you've got a point. I am all those things that you've just told me. I'm not going to argue. Yeah. Bye. You're not going to see me again. And obviously not apologise to his face as he does, but he leaves him in that little note. Yeah. And then effectively he comes back in issue six. This is all being tied up. And the first thing I would do is go back to everyone and go, oh, by the way, I'm alive still. He doesn't. Yeah. He goes on a two day bender and it's like, yeah. Fuck it. <laughs> because he's, a, yeah, it's a self-destructive character. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so much of the, so many of the interactions are frustrating to read in a way because you want him to be better. You want him to apologise to people or, you know, or go around and tell people what he's actually feeling. Because mm. you do hear his internal monologue, this sort of self-loathing monologue that runs throughout, yep. but he never verbalises any of it. It's always a mask between sarcasm, uh, you know, and drinking and smoking and this sort of facade. Mm-hmm. And and as such, as I say, I think he's a really interesting character. He's, he's very compelling yeah. because of that, because he is flawed. And then sort of comparing the endings of both films. In the film, he gets cured. He switches to, I assume, help quick gum stuff, whatever. Yeah. But then in the comic, he gets healed, he's cured, he leaves, mm-hmm. and then just starts smoking again. Because like, ah, smoking and drinking. Like, yeah, exactly. May as well carry on. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, sorted. He's cured. He can smoke again. And that's, yeah, exactly the self-destructive behavior that he engages in all the time and uh it just causes more problems for him always yeah indeed um i'm actually surprised that you've not brought this up but maybe you've been pulling back a bit in case it was in my egg section but um your egg section sounds sounds awful my egg section <laughs> god what, what um, part of you is that a demon a demon egg exorcist <laughs> is the fact that the character was drawn to look like sting yeah and i think we may have said that before on air i can't remember i think we did again i think it might be in that john episode where we interviewed him about his comic book taste i think we did well so am i right in saying that's not in your eggs it's not no but i was just uh doing a little egg way Easy music okay ian's ian's egg hunt ian's ian's egg hunt ian's ian's egg hunt i'm not yoking you Right, we are firmly in your egg section. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So, this one I actually thought was quite interesting. The Spear of Destiny prop in the film is the exact same one used in Hellboy 2004. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, there you go. Someone's just gone to their prop room and gone, 
That'll do. <laughs> Sorted. But yeah. are, are we meant to believe that Hellboy and Hellblazer? No, Constantine, Tyne, whatever, <laughs> are in the same universe? I mean, possible? Potentially. Are we going to see a tie-in? No. <laughs> Doubt it. <laughs> no, we're not. And uh, in the film, there's a billboard showing water being turned into wine. Mm-hmm. And the tagline is, Got Faith. Obviously, a play on the Got Milk American ad mm-hmm. campaign. Yeah. Quite like that. Shire, as in Shire Beef, yep. uh, has a book on his dashboard in the car called Satanism and Witchcraft. Uh, it's actually a real book and is the history of witchcraft by Jules Michelet. I, I always write these names down so I can never say them. <laughs> but the point being is that that is a real book. Cool. So I like that they've used that and not just invented a prop. Yeah. Which again might explain why he then knows so much about it at the end of the film. Yes. Because he was playing, he was in the comic book, wasn't he, that character? No, yeah, Chaz, Nothing yeah. like him again. He had a taxi. Well, it. funny you say that. Oh, okay. Because apart from Constant, apart from John, <laughs> <laughs> the only characters to survive the transition from comic to film are Papa Midnight, yep. as we said earlier, mm-hmm. Chaz Kramer, and Gabriel. Right. But also, there was a character called Ellie that was in the comic that we read. She was in issue, I think, two or three, and they're sat on a bench yeah. and talking. Yeah. Uh, she's a demon who was actually cut from the original film. Yes. There is a scene about it where he goes to meet her and whatever, similar to the comic, mm. but that was completely cut because they wanted him to be this sort of lone wolf character right. but she is in the film still so the, the long scene is cut but she's in the film still when the bit where Shia Beef puts the cross in the water oh yeah and then there's like a weird close up of this one character going holy water and you're like well there was a bit of a special zoom in there to yeah. that. Like, that was weird but that's that's her because it was like um, was it Michelle Monaghan it's like yeah you know, I think quite so quite a well known actor you yeah. know so it's strange that they had her in there for that one I think even in 2005 she was probably on the coming up you know so mm. yeah I did think that was odd okay Okay, so her role was cut. Yeah. That makes sense. Right. Uh, well, at least cut down a bit. Yeah. Other Easter eggs are uh, Raven Scar Hospital is named for the Mental Institute from the comic. So the one that John spends four years there in and out of. Right. Didn't come up in this gotcha. run. But it is there, honest. Yeah. Don't look it up. <laughs> no, I'll, be- I'll believe you. And we said about Satan being in the film. Yes. He's covered in this sort of like oily tar. Like his sort of feet are all mm. oily. And, yeah. Which I actually was surprised. That's almost a copy of one panel in the comic that's kind of like a copy of just those feet coming down. Yeah. But the original script had hell depicted as like a black void with the floor covered in oil. Right. So explains obviously the feet. Yeah. Um, so not just a place full of mist <laughs> as you yes. as you carefully the, the mist described place. it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, okay. So so then the oil in the film, I suppose, is just unexplained now. Yeah, it's just I there. mean I suppose it's um you could argue that it's like the tar of his lungs. Yeah. You know, or maybe that, Satan comes from like the deep core of earth um hell even like we've got the molten lava they've got oily tar i don't, yeah. I don't know okay and then uh finally uh in the bottom right hand corner of isabel's tag uh, someone we didn't actually bring up in the film section so the twin that dies yeah it says 616 oh. and no it's not an mcu <laughs> the universe 616 it's actually <laughs> said that the original number of the beast is 616 yes. not 666 as people mm-hmm. think it is I was going to explain the whole where that comes from and I started looking and spent my ages and I was like, I'm not going to go into no. the scribes and transcribes and yeah. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> We're not a theological podcast. If you want that, no. go and seek out something else. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but uh, that's yeah, fine. There you go. So a blend of film, comic and interesting facts. Very good. Very nice eggs this week. Yeah, some good ones. All right then. Cool. Well, let's get back to the conclusion and wrap things up then. So the film, the comic book, What were your thoughts overall? So overall, when comparing the film to the comic, I would say it's a pretty poor adaptation. But taking it at face value, it's a pretty good film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pleasantly surprised is what I would say. Oh, look at you doing the uh, this week's alliteration. That wasn't alliteration. Pleasantly surprised. Pleasantly surprised. That's P and S. I heard P's. (laughs) Pleasantly surprised. (laughs) Damn it. (laughs) Right. Anyway. (laughs) Pleasantly pleased. Yeah. Thank you. Look what look what you just did (laughs) off the cuff as well. I'm so proud of you. Yeah. It was better than I thought. (laughs) And the comic book. Yeah. Overall, a very interesting read and a look at the character Mm -hmm. a satisfying story arc and i might even say it's a hell of a comic oh i see what you did there but you know i i I wouldn't ever stoop down to wordplay no no no, of course not. you have enough difficulty with words oh that's low blow mate low blow (laughs) 
yeah, no, I, I enjoyed it a lot. I liked revisiting it. I am now tempted because I ended up buying the six issues individually because I there was loads of different versions. Mm-hmm. There was an omnibus. There was two versions of it in trade paperback. And so I ended up actually just going on eBay and buying the original six issues. Mm-hmm. And it now makes me want to go back and buy the rest of them from before yeah. that. But I can't do that. because so the, the copy that I've got is volume five. And there's it's a 12-issue run, I think. And because I finished the film so early on in the week, I thought, oh, great, I've got plenty of time. I'm going to read all, all of them. And then, because it's been so hot this week, I was like, I, I don't want to. Like, <laughs> I'll read the issues that we're going to read. <laughs> I like reading the comics. I go out in the garden on a hot day and read some comics. It's nice. Yeah, it's too hot, mate. I was a little bit. I can't <laughs> enter into that rabbit hole is the point, though. I can't start buying all of those Hellblazer yeah. comics. I already, I already buy Paraman and Iron Fist and that costs a fortune, so God knows what this will cost me. Yeah. But I really did enjoy it. You know, it's uh, a very different tonally from what we read last week, yeah. both DC. Mm-hmm. And I like that a uh, comic book publisher, a big one as well, is putting out such different titles at roughly the same time, 1980s, and this was early 90s. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to see. Mm. But yeah, watching the um, watching the film and reading the comic for me, it does make me want to go back to revisit the Constantine TV show, which I know on the outro we would I did sort of say it was bad, mm. but I want to go. I went into this film thinking it's a bad film. I want to go back to the show and thinking, right, is it a, such a bad show? Yeah. But there's a lot of characters that are in the comic and in the film in the show, so I thought that might get me through. And it's quite short as well. I don't think it's like 30 or 25. Yeah. I think it's like more like 12, 14. I think it's like half a season. It got cancelled. Yeah. Didn't it? Yeah. So there will be because a lot of the plot points from that bleed into the Arrowverse as well. Okay. But, um, well. Let me know how you get on with that. I won't be doing it. (laughs) And what was Kate's quick opinion of the film? She said, really good. I could even say, most excellent. Ah. Which, uh, yeah, you see what she's trying to do there? I see what she she did. I I think she succeeded. Oh, well, I'll pat on the back for her. Yeah. You won't hear this. No, that's fine. Well done. Uh, Well done, Kate. (laughs) Say what you want about her. No, I'm I'm not not that mean. I'm mean to her face. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Okay, then. Well, that's all for... Constantine slash Constantine slash Hellblazer slash Hellboy. (laughs) (laughs) Have you got any other business? Yes. So this week, as briefly discussed at the end of last episode, I have found an episode of Legends of Tomorrow for you to watch. Mm. I was this close to getting you to watch Arrow again. Honestly, (laughs) there's uh, an episode of Arrow that sits between... Constantine's season and the appearance in season four of this show that explains that he met Oliver on the island and whatever. Right. And I was so close to getting you to watch it because I know before I'd find it a new reason for you to watch Arrow again. <laughs> <laughs> but I decided, no, let's talk about season five, episode six, titled Mortal Khan Bat a play on what happens in the episode because effectively it does take the Dangerous Habits story arc and just crams it into one episode. Yes. So, (laughs) judging by your face, I assume you loved it and it was fantastic. (laughs) Well, I mean this in the nicest way possible, but what the fuck was that? I mean, it was... Yeah. I can't believe you've watched... Literally hundreds of hours of, of this. This is Legends of Tomorrow, by the way. I'm not sure. Yes, what this is the sort of spacey, time travelly Doctor Who esque yeah. kind of show. It was awful. Yeah, like really poorly acted, directed. They kept trying to do comedy, and it wasn't funny. Yeah, like there's that gormless guy with the glasses who just kept crying all the time. What the fuck is he? Gary. Oh my god, the most annoying person. I just wanted someone to kill him <laughs> at any point. I wanted a right, stray bullet to come in through the window from 1997 Hong Kong. <laughs> just shoot him in the face I mean what was going on I mean it was terrible Ian. yeah so effectively the main plot is pretty bad yeah it's one of the lower tier episodes <laughs> it's season five so it does get worse as it goes on great season one and two are quite strong it's not the same cast the gang have changed throughout the seasons gotcha so see, season one and two are quite strong and then it just goes downhill <laughs> okay but yeah they took some liberties into the dangerous habits storyline so pushing aside the main plot of the episode let's just get that away gladly um, i mean hold on i just want to touch upon it because 
because oh, okay. I think go viewers on, go on then. Think <laughs> listeners should hear this. It is a storyline about a immortal Genghis Khan kidnapping Prince Philip. Yep. No, Prince Charles, Prince Charles, who is in this program as a as a character, in order to take over Hong Kong during the transition between British and Chinese rule. Yes. And the way that they do that is they all ride around on scooters. <laughs> yep. It's the most asinine... Do you want... Just, what is it? Do you want some context? No! Or do you not care? I don't... No, I, I mean, I don't right. think I there's enough context in the world to make what I watched good. I don't think right. there was anything to it. There's a whole thing about the loom, a loom of fate, and I was like, I don't care. Yeah. Like, what, what, what are you talking about? Do one thing or the other. Like, the Dangerous Habits portion of the show was better than the Hong Kong portion. Yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, so that's why they've taken the story arc that we want to talk about and put it in one of the worst episodes of the show, <laughs> which this is why I was tempted to make you watch Arrow again because you'd see Constantine's reappearance and whatever. But then I thought, oh, we have to watch... Because I actually watched about four episodes, five episodes the other day, just... I was on my phone and playing around with games and whatever, but I had on... They it was the end of season four yeah. I was watching and then I sort of skipped around a bit so I came upon this one that I thought could you ask me off air oh they've done the Dangerous Habits storyline in season five but I don't think it's one episode is it no no it's it's, it's a, across the season or arc and then realising that actually no it's pretty much shoved in like there are bits that bleed off of it and go it into it sets it up on the episodes before yeah, yeah. I saw that from the previously on but it, they've taken the bot points if you will from the comic and mm. just rushed it into about 20 minutes because obviously they're cutting back into each story yeah but yeah anyway yeah. put your anger aside <laughs> okay <laughs> forget right. about um, Khan if that happens that does happen yeah, yeah I... I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't mean to anger you but yeah putting that aside yeah. what did you take of A, Matt Ryan's portrayal of the character yeah. and B, the comic book arc adaptation. Okay, right. I mean, as I say, that portion of the story was better than the rest of the episode with exception of the... Gl- Gary, did you say his name was? Yeah, Gary, the awful the guy. Jesus. That portion was better, but it still wasn't good. Um, it, The character... I mean, aesthetically, he looks more like the character from the comics, but that is about it. He also looks like... He's Welsh, isn't he? Yes, Matt Ryan's Welsh. Is he meant to be Welsh in the show? No, but you can pick up a couple of twangs of his accent, can't you? Oh, he, he was fully Welsh. I like, was <laughs> just doing it in his own voice. He also, he looks like Rod Gilbert, so he looks really Welsh as well. So I'm looking at him going, that's just Welshman. And it's fine, you know, it, there's no different to being American, but it's just a, it's a bit strange. Aesthetically, yeah, he looks a bit more like the character, but to be honest, I don't think he acts like him a great deal. He's a bit grumpy comparatively, but even then he's... Mm. Mm. The problem with these CW shows is every character is written in the same way and they're all sort of quippy. And, he is watered yeah. down a hell of a lot. This is why I want to go back and watch his own show because mm. that is a lot darker. It, it wasn't quite in the Arrowverse at that point. That was a retcon that they did. Gotcha. Um, so they made it as its own thing. And I think it's like swearing, smoking, drinking, whatever, where this, like there is a running joke which I do quite like throughout all of his appearances in the Arrowverse is that he doesn't smoke. Right. Or at least in this show. So people will turn up, take it out of his mouth. His lighter doesn't work. It rains, gets its last cigarette wet. Like there's a running joke about it. Gotcha. So they've watered him down quite a lot. Yeah. But I do like his version of it. Maybe not in this episode, but I do like what he can do with this character. Right, okay. Well, maybe this was just a poor example, but he definitely, he, he, as I say, he's got a bad dye job and he's got the clothes. So he looks more like the character, but that mm-hmm. is about it, to be honest. I don't think there was the self-loathing. I don't think there was the self-destructive behavior necessarily. He was just a bit of a grumpy. He's like a teenager's idea of what a bad boy he is. <laughs> he's the bad boy. Fair enough, him. Yeah. Maybe it was a poor example and maybe he can do better than that but mm. generally speaking the character is no closer I would say to the comic book really than the Keanu Reeves version he looks more like him but he doesn't act like him still so yeah, yeah. as for the story bizarre bizarre to just put it all into one episode yeah not even one episode. What, 15 minutes of this episode is dedicated to the storyline? Yeah, I mean, it's, what, it's like 42 minutes show and it's, yeah, about 15, potentially 20, probably not even that <laughs> yeah, of the not. show. But I mean, you probably know that something we didn't talk about earlier on is that in the film, he commits suicide when he's 14, 15, whatever, but comes back to life. In the comic, he's so full of hatred because he let a little girl die. Mm. And that little girl is called Astra. Yeah. And she's in this show. Right. So she is the lady that turns back his watch. So rather 
rather than the doctor saying you've got cancer, she eventually speeds up his clock. Yes. And just gives him like 10 years of cancer in like, like now, effectively. Yeah, it was something about he was meant to die in 10 years time. Yeah, the cancer storyline is still there, but it's it's very rushed. Yeah. Similarly, or similar to the comic, he does also try and cheat death. Mm-hmm. You know, tries to get healed, tries to use magic, all sort of stuff. And then there's a bit as well that he sort of tries to tempt down Gabriel. He's like, come on, come down here and whatever. Yeah. But it, it doesn't work. And then the ending, he kills himself again, like comic and film. Not in the same way, because that's too graphic for a teen <laughs> show. <Yeah. laughs> uh, he just takes some poison, passes out, makes a deal, comes back to life. Yes. The plot points are all there. But yeah, just rammed into 15 on-screen minutes. The problem as well is that the storyline is is good in the comic book and even in the film is because the, the cancer is a natural ailment. Yeah. It is something that has happened to him because of his own self-destructive behaviour and it is not magical in nature despite all of this weird stuff that he gets involved with. Ultimately, it was something, uh, a very human disease that could have killed him. Yes. And making it so that there is a magical phenomenon behind it, which is what they do in the TV show, yeah. having it be this watch that she speeds up, it undermines the storyline because it means that there's no... It just comes out of nowhere and is resolved just as easily. Yeah. There is no con. He just makes a promise to help her. All right. Yeah, so... I so think unless that's mom, a con in the long run... I think her mum dies... Or she died when she was a kid. Yeah. I can't remember. It's something about her mum and then he goes off and helps her mum and whatever. But her mum's yeah. in hell or something stupid. I can't remember. Pretty much. Yeah, I assume he's going to time travel. But um... this does come off the back of his own show when eventually you see the history of letting this girl die. And that was when she was of your girl. And then she gets recast as the actress you see now. Yeah. So, I mean, effectively, I've because I've seen all of it, Arrow, Constantine and The Legends. Mm. I quite enjoy it because it is just daft and stupid and I know this is the worst tail end of it. The fact that it dips in in quality after season two or three. But I didn't think you'd like it, if I'm honest. (laughs) I think there's probably a certain amount of you need to be invested with shows like this. And uh, I'm not. I can't watch. I mean, I watched 10 seasons of Smallville and that's 10 seasons too many, quite frankly. (laughs) It's the same thing. And it's the same thing they've been doing now for 20 years. Probably longer. I don't know. Mm. I I think you need to be invested in the characters and I'm not. And I don't ever see myself getting invested in those characters because they're all uh, paper thin quip machines. But then again, I mean, if I know that you wouldn't, but anyone out there that wants to watch this show, if you pick it up from episode one, season one, it does try to reboot the show Mm. almost or reboot the characters but they all come from arrow flash whatever so you kind of need to watch that stuff first then watch it's kind of like they're doing what the mcu did is that now you have to watch 15 seasons of a show to then understand the film but it's yeah it's a bit crazy and a bit much and it does kind of turn into fan service going oh they've said a captain cold he is in it in the first couple of seasons but they just drop in these characters and you're like oh i know him oh he made an appearance in in the in that episode of that one ages ago. Oh, that, that's the guy from the comics. Oh, the the old loom of fate. Oh, that was in this and whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I didn't, because you'd bounced off Arrow so much, I didn't mm. think you'd necessarily, well, I knew you would hate the actual plot of the episode. I knew that for a fact, but I was interested <laughs> to see. Because everyone does, apparently. <laughs> interested to see your take on this character, but it might have not been the best example, but I chose it because of the comic. No, no, it was a good thing to choose. You said one episode uh, and yeah, it covers the plot line, but I, it does it a massive disservice. And yeah. maybe Matt Ryan is, is is better in some of his other appearances. I know he did the voices for the animated things, like mm. you said, so maybe he's better elsewhere. But as I say, this this version is, because it's a, such a watered-down version, it's no more reminiscent, apart from aesthetically, it's no more reminiscent of the comic book character than the film is, to be honest. Yeah, well, on that note... <laughs> <laughs> that's all for this episode thank you very much for listening if you enjoyed it then do yourself a favor and subscribe for much more nonsense like it you can also blap us a five-star review if you're feeling charitable next episode we're in this together now so we're teaming up to assemble our thoughts on 2012's avengers and then we're going to assemble our thoughts on the ultimates by mark millar and brian hitch ah the avengers i can talk about that film all day goodbye everybody see ya By Mark Millar and Brian Hitch. That's a weird way of saying. Ah, The Avengers. I can talk about that film all day. Go on then. Well, no, because we did this last time where we just spoke about the next episode in the outro, so let's not do that again. And also, if we could keep it under an hour, that would be good. I'm not spending all day talking about it. I'll try. And it's done.